Okay, if I can uh, call the meeting to order, and can I welcome everyone to this, the first meeting of the Public Commissions Committee in 2019, and can I wish everyone a very happy new year. Um, can I welcome too to the gallery Dr Gabrielle Andretta, who is the President of the State Parliament of Lower Saxony. We welcome you to our consideration of petitions today. Can I also welcome Jackie Bailey, MSP, who is here for um, this session. The first petition is Petition 1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland against the care tax on the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. The petition was lodged in September 2014 and was first considered by the Session 4 Committee in November 2014. At a previous consideration of this petition in October 2018, we noted the petitioner's concerns as set out in his submission of 11 September 2018 and agreed to invite the Cabinet Secretary to give evidence to address the petitioner's concerns and provide some clarification around the Government's approach to the delivery and implementation of the extension of the free personal care policy. We received a written update on the issue from the Cabinet Secretary in November 2018, and this is included in our meeting's papers. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be accompanied by officials um, who will be here shortly, but can I... In the meantime, welcome the Cabinet Secretary to the meeting. I very much appreciate you take the time to spend with the committee this morning, and I do hope we have a, a useful uh, discussion on, on a number of, of petitions. But I understand you'll have a brief opening statement before we take questions. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, can I also wish uh, committee members and others a Happy New Year, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, and can I also apologise for the current absence of my officials uh, I'm grateful to you that we have begun on time. I wouldn't want to hold the committee up for that reason. Um, so thank you, as I said, for inviting me to attend uh, the committee. Uh, as you said, I wrote to committee on 20th November, setting out our approach to the implementation of the extension of free personal care for those under 65 to ensure that it is consistent with the current approach for those aged over 65. We want to ensure an equality of treatment between adults under and over the age of 65. Legislation was passed by this Parliament in June uh, 2018 to extend free personal care to all adults who are found eligible by their local authority, regardless of their age, condition, social economic or marital status. This exceeds the original remit of the Amanda Capel's petition, which focused on those with dementia only. The extension to free personal care will be delivered on time as the legislation comes into effect on the 1st of April 2019. This does build on previous action to reform the charging system. In 2016, we raised income thresholds, meaning that less income is taken into account. We also ensured that local authorities disregard all veterans' income from war disablement pensions and the Armed Forces Compensation Scheme from financial assessments, and we worked with COSLA to ensure that people in the last six months of a terminal illness receive free social care at home. In my previous role as, Cab as Minister for Social Security, uh, we, w in this Parliament, ensured through legislation that those who are clinically diagnosed with a terminal illness are fast-tracked to ensure that they receive the maximum level of financial support they are entitled to quickly and with dignity, regardless of any um, number that is put uh, on their terminal diagnosis in terms of the expectation when they might die, to ensure that people receive what they are entitled to at the right time and as smoothly as possible. I do believe that extending free personal care to all adults is an important further step uh, in our work of reforming charging for social care, but further steps in reforming charging must be done on a sustainable basis. I recognise that this latest step uh, does not go as far as the petitioner would like because other social charges will remain for those who do not meet the criteria I outlined earlier. Any future reform of the cost of social care and how it is paid for needs to be considered as part of our wider adult social care reform programme to ensure our approach is sustainable now and into the future. Funding for £30 million of £30 million for this extension of free personal care to those under 65 is part of our draft budget, 
which was uh, published last month, and I would hope that we will have the support across the Chamber uh, for uh, that budget in order to ensure that we have the resources to deliver this important improvement. Uh, that, with that, I will conclude, uh, convener, if I may. I'm obviously happy to deal with any questions that members may have. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, before we open to questions, can I welcome Mike Liddell, who's the policy manager of the Adult Social Care Policy, and David Fotheringham, the head of Adult Social Care Policy. Um, can I just really confirm, I think you, you did make this point in your statement, that... Um, your, your absolute expectation is that extension of free personal care to adults under the age of 65 will be impl implemented by the 1st of April. And um, are your partners in delivering this confident that that can be done? Yes, I am confirming that. Um, we have worked extensively with uh, COSLA. Uh, and in fact, only as recently as last night, I had the opportunity to discuss with Councillor Curry, who is uh, the lead uh, from COSLA on this and other matters in my portfolio uh, about the progress that is made and the readiness of local authorities to undertake uh, this delivery and I'm happy to say that we are on track. Okay. And Do you accept the argument from the petitioners um, in pursuing the argument that there shouldn't be care charges at all, that there's a human rights issues? It may not be about simply about personal care but the things that people need to support them in order for them perhaps to access work access um, college or whatever it might be that charges often mean that they are not able to do those things I think that, you know that the general argument the petition do you understand the general argument around the petition that for somebody with a, a disability it may not be about personal care it may be about provision of transport or whatever and that doesn't come in within the remit of what you've suggested I absolutely do understand that and and I have had the benefit and the privilege of the two years that I was Social Security Minister of working extensively with individuals uh, as we looked at that particular area uh, of the portfolio to understand better, from my point of view, the uh, uh, situation and the difficulties that people face. So I completely understand that. The point I'm making is that we have, we have made stepped progress in terms of charging for adult social care, and I outlined that in my opening statement. But actually, we, we want to um, consider any further progress that might be made within the current work that is uh, being led on uh, the reform of adult social care. So that, that isn't, this is part of that, it's an important part of it, any further steps we might make on charging, but it also extends, in fact, into uh, the second petition that we will uh, be considering this morning about uh, how we ensure that uh, the correct facilities and support are available for everyone in uh, our country to live as fulfilled and uh, uh, equal opportunity a life as they wish to. Would you accept if you took, a, as we, I think the Scottish Parliament has done, a human rights perspective, there is at least an argument to be explored round the way in which social care is delivered round the human rights issue, that it's, it's about levelling the playing field mm -hmm. for people so that they can mm -hmm. have access and the current charging policy is not compliant with human rights in that regard. So, in, in terms of uh, legal advice as to whether what we currently do is compliant with human rights or not and our requirement as a parliament and as a government to meet that, re that requirement, then the advice we have is that what we are currently doing is compliant. But that aside, and I think the thrust of your question, is should we adopt a human rights approach to all of this work? And I absolutely agree with that. It is an area to be explored. And the current reform work that we are undertaking on adult social care, which is people-led, um, very much adopting an, the kind of approach that we took uh, and are currently taking in social security and establishing uh, that area of work led by those with lived experience uh, in this area uh, is starts from that premise that uh, this is where we want to be. We have made significant steps as a parliament since the parliament was first established. So not simply this government, but throughout, we have made significant steps in that uh, along that road, but there is more to do, but we need to be able to do it 
in a way that is sustainable, both financially and in other ways. So we need to take the time to undertake that work so we properly understand everything that needs to be done to continue to improve and reform adult social care, including the question of charging. Thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Following on from the, the convener's initial question, uh, you say that you're, you're on track uh, with regard to the implementation, but uh, I'm curious as to whether you anticipate any barriers to the implementation uh, and um, also, has everything been fully costed and budgeted for? Uh, we, we believe completely that it has been fully costed and budgeted for, and we've undertaken that work with COSLA, um, including looking at uh, and including in that um, uh, budgeted, a current draft budgeted amount that I uh, set out, uh, an estimate uh, with COSLA on the implementation costs uh, to local authorities of undertaking this additional work. Um, discussions have uh, been undertaken with directors of social work, with directors of finance and with others to ensure that uh, people understand uh, everything uh, that is uh, to be done here and that we hear uh, anything that they think may uh, stand in their way and we work with them to try and uh, remove any uh, concerns or misunderstandings that might exist. So on the basis of that significant shared work uh, over a number of months and where we are now, and as I said, my conversation uh, as recently as uh, yesterday evening, uh, I remain confident that we are on track to deliver this from the 1st of April. Okay. We, sorry, I should also say uh, my apologies, uh, Mr MacDonald. Of course, in all of this, uh, the work is, uh, is around how you estimate costs and the reality then is what the real costs uh, may be and they may differ from those estimates. So some of the work that we're undertaking with COSLA is around how we monitor the delivery and included in the delivery, the cost of delivery in order to be sure that we can year on year uh, adjust uh, what needs to be done in order to make sure that this can be fully delivered to all those who wish it. Thank you. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you have acknowledged uh, that this extension doesn't go as far as the petitioner would like. Um, I wonder if you maybe would be good enough to explain the rationale behind that decision to do this on, on a consistent basis with the approach for adults over the age of 65. So, sorry, Mr Widow, you want me to explain well, I, I why I... we want it to be the same for over and under 65s? Yes, please. If you could. Um, quite simply, because if I can go back to uh, the convener's um, perfectly um, helpful and correct starting question, our, our belief is that we should move progressively and increasingly towards an equality of approach, uh, because that, that sits absolutely rightly with a human rights-based approach. Uh, and so it seemed to us that it was the right thing to do if we were going to extend this to those under the age of 65 to go beyond a particular condition that individuals uh, might be uh, suffering from and extend it to all adults under the age of 65 uh, who then uh, meet the criteria in terms of uh, free as opposed to charging. Thank, thank you. If I could, uh, Camille, just, mm -hmm. just with, with that in mind, I wonder then if, if you could respond to the petitioner's comment that, uh, and I quote, that this will leave uh, most disabled people under 65 no better off, despite millions being given to local authorities for the implementation of, of the new system. I wonder if that, you feel that's consistent with this, the, the, the answer you gave to my previous question. Um, well, I, I need to start by saying I, I don't agree with the petitioner's view on that matter. Um, the, the fact is that what we will implement from the 1st of April with our colleagues in local government is that every adult, regardless of their income or assets, is eligible to receive the personal care they require without charge. Um, now, many of those in receipt of social care already rece receive those services free, uh, and we have provided uh, the additional funding of £11 million pounds that I touched on earlier to increase the charging thresholds and to support uh, veterans, as I described. Um, so I, I don't accept um, the petitioner's premise. What I do understand 
uh, and accept is that there is an absolute need for us to consider whether we can go any further in this regard. And as I've said, uh, I think the appropriate way for us to do that is, in, is within our current overall consideration of re the reform of adult social care um, appropriate, I think, in the 20th year of this Parliament to stop and say, so what more do we need to do across adult social care, including charging, but there are other matters to be taken into account in that regard as well. Can I, just, just a very brief, uh, thank you for that very helpful, uh, Kavisekou. Just given, given the petitioner's concern and uh, obviously which you don't agree with, which is which is fair. How will you monitor that to make sure that, uh, that, that the concerns of the petitioner uh, are not realised? So, as I said uh, uh, in response to uh, Mr MacDonald, uh, we are working with uh, and developing with COSLA uh, a series of monitoring tools that we will um, test run, in fact, before the 1st of April. Um, to gather information and to check that we are gathering all the information we will need uh, from local authorities in terms of implementation. Uh, but the reform, uh, and that will include uh, impacts uh, on individuals as well as questions, key questions about the reality of the cost set against our current estimate, uh, agreed estimate with COSLA of the cost. Uh, but it, in addition, all of this sits within that piece of work that I uh, touched on earlier that is led by those with lived experience uh, around the reform of adult social care. Um, uh, we have a leadership group of uh, individuals from that area, stakeholders, a panel uh, that is doing uh, some of that work, many of whom I had the uh, good fortune to uh, meet and listen to uh, in, uh, in 2018. Uh, and that will also provide us with feedback about any uh, individuals uh, or uh, groups who appear to be being missed, even with this extension, uh, that we can consider uh, in that overall reform, including any re further reforms on charging. Thank you. Um, Rachel Hamilton. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I want to kind of um, hone down a bit more on the, the monitoring um, process that's going on. In your letter um, on the 20th of November, you state that the implementation advisory group um, had considered the effects of additional demand in assessing the likely budget required. Now, you state that the non-personal element, um, elements of care for adults under the age of 65 will be monitored. Firstly, how will that be monitored and who will be monitoring that? So the, the monitoring arrangements are shared arrangements between Scottish Government and local authorities. Uh, local authorities are, are the, the primary provider of the data, if you like, um, as, you, as you would expect. Um, but uh, clearly there are some very prominent and experienced stakeholder groups in this area of work and our continued contact with them will feed information in to that monitoring as well. We've developed, as I said earlier, uh, a series of tools for monitoring uh, across more than just cost. Uh, again, in, um, uh, jointly with COSLA, we, we will test run those tools before the 1st of April, just to double check that we are capturing all the data that we think uh, is needed uh, in order to effectively monitor all of this over the years um, and as required uh, should it be required, make any adjustments and changes to how we're implementing this as we go. But though that monitoring information, the data gathered, also feeds into the overall reform of adult social care that we're undertaking, because that will be important information to point us towards, uh, on the basis of evidence, where there may be gaps uh, or other areas that we need to take account of. Okay, um, thank you for that. I am interested in um, this system that you're going to be using um, with regards to the, the, the tools that you, you say that for, you're going to use for monitoring, because the petitioner actually shares the same concerns that I have about um, non-residential care services, um, whether they be uh, something like a, a community alarm or um, other, other services, but they can range 
dramatically across local authorities. Um, I do have some figures that uh, say that East Lothian charges, for example, for, I'm just using these local authorities as examples, by the way, but East Lothian charges £4 a week for um, a community care alarm and Aberdeen charges £1.35 for a care alarm. So we're already seeing a disparity in these uh, care services. And I... I don't know um, if the tool that you're going to be using, whether it's software or whether it's some sort of um, monitoring, uh, di monitoring digitally, but that's already showing that um, we're at a, a huge disparity across local authorities. <coughs> and, and <coughs> excuse me, without sight of your figures, I'm, I'm not going to disagree. I'm not going to disagree with the, the central thrust of what you're saying, that there is a degree of disparity across local authorities. Um, now... One of, the th one of the areas we have to temper here in how we look at this work is the balance between wanting to have equity across our country in what people receive and how that is charged for and how they are dealt with, with the fact that we have 32 local authorities, each of them in their own right, democratically elected and accountable bodies to those, to the population that they serve in their local authority area. And that is, is, is uh, as a tension, if you like, between what Scottish Government wants to do and local authorities' uh, perfectly correct position about their um, democratic mandate and their accountability is a tension that I know colleagues around this table are very familiar with and is 20 years old. Um, so in, that is why the, the joint work with COSLA is so important in order to manage our way through some of that and look at where we can increase the equity of provision on the basis of local authorities not only being uh, willing to agree that, and, and they, there is, there's no question that they're not willing, but also be feeling that they are being treated fairly in terms of the resource that they receive to do it. Uh, on the question of the monitoring and the tools, I'm very happy <clears throat> to write further to the committee uh, setting out what those are uh, so that members um, are, are aware of it and see that level of detail and answer uh, following that any further questions that members may have. Can I just... <coughs> um, just <coughs> lastly, Cabinet Secretary, on the balance of equity, what is your time scale with regards to this monitoring? You, I'm, I'm probably um, I'm asking this too soon. It's a bit futuristic, but we are on the cusp if it's being rolled out on the 1st of April. How will, how, regardless of politics or who has been democratically elected within local authorities, how will you ensure that there is an equity and a balance within that equity? What will happen, for example, if with working with COSLA, what will happen if we see that one local authority is charging extraordinary amounts and another is charging what is considered fair amounts? How will, what will happen? Will there be some sort of uh, negotiation? Will there be a sanction? Will, will What will happen? There won't be a sanction um, because that's that's not the best way to work in partnership with colleagues and local authorities. Um, there will be continuous discussions with local authorities. And I think we have a bit of an example about how we might manage that and reach a shared agreement when we look at school uniforms, for example, um, where local authorities have diff had different um, <clears throat> approaches in terms of the support that they would offer to eligible families uh, and for the purchase of school uniforms. And we manage through, through discussion, uh, because at the end of the day, every, you know, more or less everybody wants to do the right thing, and you have to work out how collectively can we get closer to that right thing uh, as possible, both in terms of, of managing some of those tensions that I touched on, but also in a way that is re resource sustainable, then we will do that here. Um, and I think that we, we have benefited uh, over years, uh, I think, uh, as a parliament, in terms of, a, of a, a good quality relationship with local authorities and with COSLA, notwithstanding political differences and disagreements uh, from time to time on matters. Um, you just keep doing that because that is the right way to reach conclusions and, and move it step by step forward. Okay. Okay. Um, David Torrance. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. 
The petitioner has previously raised concerns that some local authority representatives are poorly informed about the delivery of the extension. What is your response to that? <coughs> yes, I, I understand that. Um, I, I, I uh, believe that uh, a great, you know, we have done a great deal of work with local authorities uh, to ensure that um, they are uh, very well informed uh, about the extension and about what's required in the implementation, not just uh, at councillor level, but uh, as important, if not arguably in terms of impl implementation, more important uh, at the level of their officials. Um, I've had a number of com conversations with Councillor Johnson. We sent a joint letter in July last year setting out, uh, he and I, what, uh, what was planned and what was required. Um, we've also, as I touched on earlier, um, had discussions with uh, the Chief uh, Social Work Officers Group, um, with uh, local authorities, Chief Finance Officers, and we issued further guidance to local authorities on the 21st of December. Um, we continue to meet with COSLA. Obviously, COSLA continue to monitor um, through their uh, network uh, local authorities' preparedness and understanding. And there is no question in my mind that if COSLA felt there was any significant difficulty in this area, then they'd be raising that with me and wanting uh, me to do something further. Thank you. Okay. I wonder if I can come back to this issue about... Um the role of the Scottish Government in, in monitoring. I and mean, we're aware that um, the Scottish Government does have a reserved power to intervene, um, which I think was given in 2002. Um, it's, not been, uh, it's not been used, not been exercised. There would be an evaluation of guidance from COSLA, and that's never, ever happened. And if you look at the petitioner's um, evidence, they talk about you know variation in a single hour of home care being between eight fifty six an hour, twenty three pounds seventy hour. They're very exercised by the issue of minimum um, income thresholds. The COSLA recommends that the income support level plus sixteen point five percent, but local authorities across Scotland set this at different amounts. For a single person under sixty, it varies from one hundred twenty two pounds per week in East Ayrshire. £273 per week in North Lanarkshire, and both are less than the actual amount of income support that disabled people can get. Do you accept that there is a very substantial issue here, particularly for people under 65, in terms of their abil ability to sustain education, employment, so on, because of the level of charging? And one of the things that the petitioner goes back to is that the cost to all of us in folk not being able to achieve their potential, not being able to um, access education work um, because they simply can't afford the charging and the, the variability across the country is, is so significant. I wonder if you see there being that this is a matter of urgency. I think this is the strongest thing that comes out of the petitioner is the urgency of this for many people. They are making decisions now which are denying them opportunities in the future. <laughs> and, and as I said, I, I understand that. I also completely share the, the petitioner's view that where people are denied the opportunity to pursue uh, what the rest of us take for granted, whether that is uh, employment or education or simply uh, social engagement, then that is, in very real terms, a cost counted in more than financial terms uh, to society uh, in Scotland as a whole. I, I absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, Yes, there is a, a reserve power. Um, I, I do not believe that other than in the most extreme circumstances, any government should ever seek uh, to use such a thing. I don't believe that that is the right way to make those approaches. Um, the reserve power wasn't to come in and close down local authority. It was to say the, the guidance isn't... It, we're going to evaluate the guidance. The guidance is not effective. And if the gap between the funding that I've described here the inconsistency around what is defined as minimum income and indeed what is caught um, or defined as income. There's an example of a young woman campaigner who told me, and she, was, she made a film about this, who said that her student loan was counted as income. Mm -hmm. And these were issues that therefore massively imp impacted on her mm -hmm. ability to do any, what any other non-disabled young person would be able to do. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that uh, given the scale of these inconsistencies, that either the Scottish Government uses their power 
or we do turn the issue on its head as a petitioner asks, because if we start from the premise, this is human rights, this is about the ability to get the support that allows you to function um, as in, with a bit of support in, in the world, that would actually, get, instead of getting bogged down in all of these different ways of dealing with things across the board, you took that view, it would be much more simple and straightforward? It, it, is a, it is absolutely the simple and straightforward view, but at the end of the day, you have to implement it and you have to be able to do it in a way that is sustainable. And those matters, that inconsistency in charging uh, and the other issues that, that uh, both the petitioner and yourself have raised uh, uh, constitute a significant part of the discussions that we have in the current work on the overall reform of adult social care and what we need to do next. And we do that jointly in our discussion with COSLA to understand the rationale from different local authorities on how they approach this and what we need to do in order to reach uh, improved equity of charging across the piece. So, so you would be open to, in that <clears throat> discussions, looking at this approach, which with a human rights approach, as you start from the basis that no matter what the size of the cake, people have right to access it uh, in a fair way with the end point of being able to have the same economic, social opportunities as others? Well, I think, I think in terms of what we have done with under 65s, then, then I think we have adopted that approach. Um, overall, that's my, my answer to Mr uh, Whittle's question about why we extended uh, the provision under 65s beyond a single condition in order to ensure a degree of equality of approach uh, regardless of age. Now, uh, taking that on to the next steps uh, is, as I've said earlier, uh, part of what we should do and what we are doing in the reform of adult social care. And, and I think it, I have made it clear that my starting point uh, is absolutely to consider this on the basis of a human rights perspective, but we need to also be able to uh, not simply have the warm words of a good policy, but be able to implement it in a way that is sustainable. But, and therefore, you recognise that in terms of <coughs> participation, frustration of the petitioner, um, when they, they did meet with the implementation uh, group, but they were only allowed to make a presentation, they were not engaged in terms of developing the policy, you would look for something more than that in the future? Well, the petitioner is, is one voice amongst many. I, I would certainly be very happy that, that all those voices are heard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at the, in terms of the group they represent, they felt they got a hearing, but that's not the same thing as being engaged and involved. Would mm -hmm. you recognise that? Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for that, uh, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, convener. And, uh, you know, I, I absolutely have no doubt about the Cabinet Secretary's intentions, but you'll forgive me if I'm slightly frustrated, as indeed the petitioners are. Um, there was guidance <coughs> issued in 2002. That wasn't evaluated. Um, I think it was at least nine years ago that Cosler and the Scottish <laughs> Government set up yet another working group, again, to look at consistency of charging. I'm not sure it ever produced any guidance. If it did, that guidance has certainly not made a difference. Um, so I'm wondering, and I hear what you say about your current work on the reform of adult social care, and that's very welcome, but when will it be concluded? And will it make any difference, given the history, both in 2002 and nine years ago, under the current government? Well, um, <laughs> what... <sighs> I have to start by saying I was not the Cabinet Secretary in 2002 or nine years ago. And I, so I can only speak from my own personal commitment to this. Uh, the, the work that is underway in the reform, the overall reform of adult social care has a number of important strands in it. This is an important strand, and that is around the whole question of consistency. Um, we will conclude... Um, elements of that work uh, as we get towards the summer of this year. Um, uh, we have to determine, along with those who are the important part, one of the important elements of how we are undertaking this current review is that those voices of lived experience and, and a version of the approach that we took in terms of social security. And part of what we are asking those individuals uh, and stakeholder groups to tell us, to tell us and COSLA, is what are your priority areas 
that you want us to fix first. Right? Uh, I think it would be a reasonable expectation that consistency of charging will feature in those priority areas. Uh, and so we will, as we proceed, as that work proceeds, my conversations with COSLA proceed in parallel because um, I'm not in the business of, and I don't have the time, frankly, to wait for the work to conclude and then we have the discussions with COSLA and then we do. And do. There's no reason why it can't run in parallel. So it runs in parallel and looking at... Uh, some of the, um, uh, the approaches that were taken, for example, on, on school uniforms is a, is a good indicator for me about the way in which we can work together and try and reach a degree of equity uh, and try and see uh, whether or not in the course of this year we can produce uh, a better resolution to this question than we currently have. But at this point, that is as much as it is fair for me to say, because it is a joint discussion between uh, me as a representative of the Scottish Government and uh, COSLA representing local authorities. OK, so we can expect in summer of this year some change to happen, because, you know, I've, again, you know, I don't doubt what you're saying is your intention, um, but history tells us that no matter the partnership, the discussion, things don't change on the ground. And, and the reason I'm so exercised by this is if you take people in my own constituency in Western Bartonshire where charges have trebled because the local authority has limited resources, people are taking themselves out of their own care packages because they can't afford to contribute to them. So we have very real unmet need because of the inconsistencies in care charging, not something I think the Cabinet Secretary wants to see. So if the, the conversations, the dialogue, the discussion get us to the same place we are today, what will you do then? So I, I am not going to um, be, be um, curtailed into the by the summer there will be guidance and there will be change. Right? I, I, um, I could easily say that that is the case, uh, but I don't think that's the right thing to do. I'm only going to put dates on things that I am confident that I will meet, and I think Ms Bailey would expect that of me. But, but uh, I am uh, more than willing to say that by uh, the summer of this year, I will be in a position to make sure that this committee and others in the Parliament are updated on how well we are making progress in this area. Um, there are a number of um, difficult issues around the whole question of resourcing and charging and equity, some of which you've touched on. One of the other big areas is where we have uh, high, high cost packages uh, and uh, some of uh, the impact on individuals of how local authorities seek to manage that high cost uh, can uh, have a significant impact on individuals. Some of our key third sector uh, providers uh, have very strong views on this that need to be listened to. And also uh, very uh, important um, propositions about how it might be handled that equally need to be listened to. And those two areas of work uh, are the subject of, have been the subject of discussion with COSLA since this summer. And we'll continue to do that to see if we uh, can reach uh, an improvement with them. I, I not necessarily go as far as to commit to an absolute resolution, but an improvement on the current situation going forward. Um, and so that work is underway at the same time as we're looking more widely at some of the other areas in uh, adult social care. Okay. Convener, if I might <coughs> ask one more question, just to um, shift this over slightly. My, my interest is, ev is ever in numbers. Um, and I wonder whether you could provide, perhaps not now, but, but to the committee, um, the budget for free personal care for over 65s and the number of people that that, that covers and your estimates for the budget for those who will now f receive free personal care that are under 65 and the numbers. And the reason I'm asking for that is the contention by the petitioner is that those under 65 receive less free personal care than those that are older. Um, and therefore, for the younger cohort, the under 65s, this isn't actually as much benefit as we imagine it would be because they receive other kinds of care support that wouldn't be covered by this. So that would help us understand, actually, the impact of the policy. Yeah, I'm very happy 
um, to undertake that we'll provide you with those figures. Are, are they correct in their assumptions? Because they, they based it on raw data from the Scottish Government, I think, that is no longer published, but, but that was their analysis at the time. Is that, do you think, correct in terms of their analysis of the situation? Uh, I don't know, Mike, if you want to say anything. Or, I, I think I would say that um, uh, the Scottish Government uh, doesn't always agree with the analysis that Scotland against the care tax produce. They sometimes, you know, we sometimes see things differently, but I mean, obviously we're happy to provide you with information based on what we regard as reliable sources um, so that you can, you can okay. see that. These are from you? Is it but, but, data but, but, from the but, but Scottish obviously government. data can be ah, okay. uh, analysed in different ways, mm. different assumptions can be made. So, I mean, we, I think we can only undertake to, uh, for our analysts who are very skilled in this area. I'm, I'm Scotland Against Care Tax are also very skilled, I'm sure, but you know, we will obviously commit to providing it in, 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 in a, with our own uh, modelling and assumptions, uh, which we'll make clear. Yeah, I think that bit is, is partly the critical bit. There are numbers and then there are assumptions and modelling and we will provide you with what we have used. Thank you very much. I should say in terms of this petition, basically when um, the argument was made, basically they said, oh, it's a big, huge, massive sum and therefore it couldn't be done because it was unsustainable and actually on being pressed, the big, huge, massive sum, people couldn't explain how they'd got to that figure. So I think reasonably the petitioners expect a bit of rigour around the figures. Um, but also I think and I wonder if you'd be interested in looking at this, is a cost-benefit analysis of people being able to get to work, to, to study, not to have to withdraw themselves from care packages and so on. There is a benefit to that, which could be set aside against the cost of it of, of any estimated care packages. But I think the committee would be very interested in those figures. I'm going to ask Brian to come in. Thank you. I mean, I, um, uh, sorry, I just wanted to go back. It's just my own clarification, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I think it's been mentioned... Uh, several times around the inconsistency and in charging of approaches uh, across uh, local authorities and that uh, in the Community Care and Health of Scotland Act 2002, the Scottish Government did have the power to regulate the practice of care charging. Totally understand the uh, position that there is this tension between you know, a, a Scottish Government uh, uh, um, policy and implementation um, of freedom to implement from local authorities uh, and for that reason um, haven't exercised that power to date. Uh, preparing that sort, preparing that sort of uh, support, support of a self-regulation uh, by COSLA, but also there was a commitment there to hold this power reserve until the implementation of the guidance from COSLA uh, could be evaluated. And it's my understanding that evaluation has never taken place, and I wonder whether you have any plans to 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 evaluate that and, and whether that would be uh, helpful at all. Um, I have to. Uh, confess, Mr Whittle, um, I have no reason to disagree with you that the evaluation uh, did not take place. Um, I'm very happy to uh, discuss with officials the value of evaluating that now, uh, given the other work that we're undertaking, uh, and to come back to you on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just in conclusion, you, you did mention your people-led policy group, and I wondered if you could clarify um, who's in the leadership group and you know what kind of lived experience will people have and to what extent would the experience of those reflected in the work of the petition which is a very broad coalition of people behind it would they be engaged with that and how you see them being engaged i think in terms of the sense from the petitioners that they had a hearing but weren't particularly engaged in the past i wonder how you would maybe address that well the um the people-led policy uh, work um, is uh, hosted by and led by inclusion uh, on our behalf. So we have commissioned uh, inclusion as the organisation to undertake that work uh, on our behalf. Uh, in terms of those who are involved in the leadership group, uh, I don't know if we have a list here, but I'm very happy to um, advise you of that, to provide that information. Uh, all of the information that I've committed uh, to providing the additional information, uh, we will make sure you have it by next week. Um, and uh, so that will include uh, exactly who is on uh, the leadership panel and the way in which that, that policy-led work or people-led policy work is uh, progressing and okay. its time frame. Okay, I think that's, that's very helpful. Rachel, finally. Just a small point. I just wanted to um, put this on record on behalf of the petitioner that um, despite what Brian Whittle was talking about, the original guidance from COSLA being just advisory, the petitioner had actually is very 
sceptical um, that COSLA um, will ever succeed in stand standardising the care charges. And you've mentioned COSLA a lot and your work with COSLA. Um, the, the petitioner um, is basically concluding, which Joanne Lamont said, is that um, you know care should be made on a human rights issue at the end of the day because he believes that there's no possibility that we will ever get to this position of standardising care charges. So I just wanted to leave you with that point because it is important that we do uh, communicate what the petitioner actually is stating here. I, I think that's very clearly communicated. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of then, thank you very much for um, responding to our questions and the way you have, and we look forward to um, receiving um, the information that you've, you've committed to. In terms of action, I think probably the most important thing would be to get a response from the petitioner to what we've, we've heard today, um, and, once, and indeed from others who may want to respond um, to what they've heard. We can reflect in these further submissions and see what we may wish to do subsequent to that. And obviously, once we have more information from the Cabinet Secretary, that would be useful. Is there anything else we should be thinking of doing? I think the, the petitioner's response is probably the most important thing. Yeah. Okay, in that case, um, I think we're, we're, we're concluding our consideration of that petition. Can I <coughs> thank the Cabinet Secretary for that? And I'll suspend briefly in order to have an ex a, a change of, uh, changeover of officials. Thank you. Okay, if we can call the meeting um, back to order, and we now move to the second petition for consider consideration, which is Petition 1545 on Residential Care Provision for the Severely Learning Disabled. This petition has also been under consideration for a number of years. It was lodged by Anne Maxwell on behalf of the Muir Maxwell Trust in December 2014, and was first considered by the Session 4 Committee in March 2015. At our meeting on 25th of October 2018, we noted the petitioner's anger and disappointment with the lack of progress in the action she is calling for in the petition. Of particular concern to the petitioner is the data visibility of learning disabled children and young people across Scotland, together with the lack of suitably high quality and appropriately resourced residential care homes. We agree to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary to respond to the petitioner's concerns. And for this session, the Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by Gillian Barclay, Strategic Lead for Dementia, Learning Disabilities and Autism, and Polly MacDonald, Policy Officer, Autism and Learning Disabilities. And Cabinet Secretary, can I invite you to provide a brief opening statement, after which we'll move to questions. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, and again, uh, my thanks to you for the opportunity to speak to you briefly on um, uh, this important matter of residential care for severely learning disabled people. 
Um, firstly, though, I want to record uh, my respect and appreciation of the Maxwell family for all the uh, significant work of the Muir Maxwell Trust in providing practical support to families raising children with epilepsy and for helping wider understanding and awareness of that condition. It is um, significantly important work and valued, I know, by everyone who benefits from it. Kavmina has been a policy priority since the 1980s, consistent uh, across uh, different governments of different political parties, that all adults with learning disabilities, including those with complex needs, should experience meaningful and fulfilled lives. This includes uh, where individuals live, as well as the services they receive. The closure of large-scale hospitals is, I believe, widely acknowledged as a major step forward for the human rights of people with learning disabilities. And I am sure that no one uh, here wants to return to large-scale residential institutions. Now, whilst we have come a very long way, I believe, since that time, I acknowledge that it has not always been a smooth road. But learning, uh, Scottish learning disabilities policy from the early days of Same As You and Keys to Life has been developed on a human rights basis and informed by listening to the views of people with learning disabilities and their families. During this time, we have not heard a persistent call for more residential care establishments, indeed quite the opposite. Finding appropriate and sustainable community placements for people with the most complex needs has nonetheless proved difficult. It is true that the sector has some good examples of very good practice where people with complex needs are well supported and do live full and active lives in their communities. When things have not gone so well, though, we find examples of individuals who've undergone multiple placement breakdowns, hospital admissions and difficult experiences, and who have not received the right support at the right time uh, in order uh, to meet uh, their uh, desired outcomes. But what we do know is that people with profound learning disabilities and the most complex health needs can be well supported with personalised care packages in their own homes and with their own tenancy agreements. In my view, this makes for better provision. The provision is available across the country. All adults with severe or profound learning disabilities are entitled to this support. They do not have to live with their family unless they and their family wish this. I want to touch briefly on the recently published report uh, by Dr Anne MacDonald, which uh, the government commissioned, which looked in some depth at the reasons why young people with learning disabilities end up being placed in care homes or hospital facilities far from their families and their home communities. She found that the factors influencing why young people uh, end up in this position uh, are multifaceted and complex. As a consequence, solutions for uh, this situation and this group of young people need more than individualised service changes, but must instead be seen with the con within the context of a more transformational systems change. We agree with her conclusions and are working with uh, our integration authorities to take forward the recommendations in the report on how we can ensure that this happens. Support to people with learning disabilities needs to be framed in the broader context of equality and social justice and not solely within the narrower focus of service design and delivery, important though that is. Services or models of care um, should not be uh, the sole focus. It is about everyone with a learning disability having access to the support they need uh, and that crucially they are involved in the decisions about all of these. Um, I am committed to ensuring that we uh, implement the recommendations of Dr MacDonald's report and our current work uh, that we touched on in the earlier uh, petition uh, on the reform of adult social care working with those uh, directly uh, engaged in this and with that personal experience and with families uh, will, I'm certain, help us achieve that. Okay, thank you very much. Can I um, start by asking how you'd respond to the petitioner's concerns and disappointment that in the four years since her petition was lodged, quote, nothing constructive and supportive has resulted? 
uh, I, I don't agree with that. I don't believe that that is an entirely uh, fair characterisation uh, of where we are. I would certainly share uh, what I, I'm sure is some of the petitioner's frustration that uh, we haven't seen enough done, but I don't accept that nothing uh, has been done. There are some examples of very good practice where people with complex needs are well supported and live full and active lives in their communities. Uh, B-Swing in uh, Dumfries and Galloway, TV at Court in Midlothian, Murray Council, New Homes and others. Uh, but I do acknowledge that there are examples where this hasn't worked uh, and we uh, need to do uh, more working um, with our integration authorities to implement the recommendations of Dr Macdonald's report. But are you aware that one of the reasons and we, we, we sought an invitation for yourself to come along was that the response from the Scottish Government was not to respond to the questions that the petitioner was raising and was suggesting that research was being done which was not round the issues that were, she was identifying round the needs of people who were um, in, in, in the category of somebody with complex needs? Or do you simply think this is a, a policy difference? That you simply don't believe that there is a need for long-term care for people with complex needs? That, that, that should always be supporting the community rather than those kinds of um, units? Uh, well, uh, part, part of what I have to do is listen to a range of organisations, including, of course, the petitioner, uh, but also organisations like Enable, who... Um, uh, and I would quote from them, it is vital that we resist any temptation to revert to building more multi-bed residential units. Um, there are different approaches that can be taken in terms of uh, the accommodation and the support packages and how that is configured. And I think I've given a, uh, some examples of that. I've had discussions with uh, Kevin Stewart, as you know, the Minister for Housing, on some of the approaches that we might take in terms of uh, the government's commitment on uh, social housing build uh, and the work with some uh, RSLs. There, there is some coverage of this too in our disability delivery plan, but what I uh, do not agree with uh, and would share Enable's view is that we do not want a return to multi-bedded residential units. I suspect that's not what the petitioner wants either. But, you know, there'd be a false characterisation to present that these are the only two choices, but that there is something about um, particular needs that are not being addressed. And part of it is the argument that actually these people are not even visible in terms of the data, which is a lot of what the conversation with the Scottish Government has been. But can I uh, bring in Angus MacDonald at this point? OK, thanks. Um, Come here. You, you mentioned in your opening remarks, Cabinet Secretary, uh, that you're committed to ensuring access to the support that uh, learning disabled children need. Now, um, what assurances can you give the petitioner that the issues raised in her petition will be and uh, are being given due consideration by the Scottish Government to deliver support for vulnerable and severely learning disabled children, young adults and, the, excuse me, and their families? Well, I think... Um, <coughs> A, a significant part of my answer to that is contained in the work that we commissioned from Dr Macdonald and in the recommendations of her report and our acceptance of those recommendations and the work that we now need to do um, in conjunction with the integration authorities to uh, ensure that we can deliver on those recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Um, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the, 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 uh, the convener mentioned there um, uh, identifying the databases uh, for this young group here, and I think, or for this group of people, I think understanding what uh, support is required um, to be delivered by the Scottish Government, uh, I think it, it would be required to, to understand uh, you know, what, what databases and identify the databases uh, for this group. And I wonder how you would respond to the petitioner's uh, comment that the Scottish Government has, and I quote, uh, repeatedly deflected the matter uh, to the Learning Disabilities Observatory in an attempt to convince her, the petitioner, that, this is, uh, that its research is relevant to the issues raised. The Learning Disabilities Observatory was set up to provide a high standard of research uh, analysis on data that is routinely collected uh, about people with learning disabilities. It's data that we need. Um, of course, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that that is all that we need to do, and I'm happy uh, 
particularly on the basis of Dr Macdonald's report, to look further at how we might improve both data collection but also data analysis and how that informs uh, the work that we need to undertake to improve this situation. It, it could be. I think following on from that, I mean, if there is an apparent absence of, of clear databases, I wonder if you have an estimate of how many children and young people require uh, long-term residential care provision. And again, how would you respond to the, the petitioner's uh, assertion that the group of young people are actually uh, invisible? So my understanding is that if um, we based it on research findings, um, uh, approximately a thousand. So there uh, are um, just over 5,000 children, 21,000 adults in Scotland with learning disabilities, uh, approximately 1,000 children and 4,000 adults from that group have severe learning disabilities uh, and a similar number with profound learning disabilities. Um, now, these are uh, numbers of people um, who uh, require significant additional levels of support um, some of that may be particular to uh, their residential needs, their accommodation needs. Uh, for others, it will be a combination of that and other areas of support. Thank you. Okay. I wonder if the, the Cabinet Secretary is aware that the observatory in responding to the petition said that um, we are not aware of any existing data sets in Scotland to include a marker for profound learning disabilities. The observatory figures that the Cabinet Secretary has just quoted were an estimate. Um, so, the, so the petition is right. Yeah. There is no marker for We don't know what the level of need is no. for profound learning disability. That's correct. Which, so while I, mean, I think m most people here would be very much in support of the thrust of policy around community support, inclusion, and uh, the end to long stay, care, hospitals and all the rest of it, we do not even know. We don't know, and the point the petition makes is there's no visibility for the particular needs of those with profoundly learning disabilities. Do you think there should be research in that regard, and would you be able to make a commitment to carry that forward? Uh, we can certainly yes, I would. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, if I can move on to you, Rachel. Thank you, convener. Um, so in Scotland, um, the petitioner states that there's no uh, long-term residential uh, care facilities, but she also... Um, makes the point that whilst there's not enough in England, there are some good quality residential care homes. And she's, she states a number of them, um, for example, the David Lewis Centre in Cheshire, Home from Home Lincolnshire, um, St Elizabeth, Hertfordshire, and, and she goes on. Um, so there's a kind of a different position in the rest of England in terms of residential care. Um, well, why is it that they're, that's, that they're looking at it from a different point of view to us? Well, clearly I, I can't answer for the but, approach that England takes. Yeah, but the petition is actually, the petition is asking, um, you know, she, she doesn't understand why we don't have the res long-term residential care facilities in Scotland. And so naturally, a uh, petitioner would look elsewhere to um, find other examples of that provision. And I just wondered if there had been any work done to suggest that those types, that type of um, provision, that service, actually has a benefit because why would that be offered in the rest of the UK when it's not in Scotland? I'm just trying to answer, get an answer on behalf of the yeah. petitioner, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah, no, I, I do understand what, you, what you're asking me. And I, I, think, um, I think there may be a, a, a false distinction being made here about what is residential care and what isn't residential care. So the convener, quite rightly, um, made it clear that the petitioner is not looking for a return to the situation that we had in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, none of us are. Um, but, but some of the examples I gave in terms of Midlothian housing, for example, and others, uh, would constitute a form of residential care, but in individual homes. Now, uh, I, I believe that I need to understand better um, from the petitioner, and I've not had the benefit of uh, meeting with her yet, exactly what it is that she is looking to see that isn't the examples that I'm pointing to, but equally isn't uh, that return to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what, is, what is it? What exactly is it? Uh, so that we can have that better 
conversation, because that is important to inform the work that we then do to implement the recommendations from Dr. McDonald's report. So um, well, I, I, think, I, I think that would be intend extremely generous. to do that. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's an extremely generous offer, and I think that the petitioner, you know, if if we the convener took it to the petitioner, then um, you know we can we can ask that question, and I think it would be very very helpful um, to distinguish uh, the complex needs and services that yeah. she is um, actually talking about. Thank you. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is aware that one of the arguments the petitioner makes is that because people, and it's a blessing, people with learning disabilities are able to live longer and, and quite often into um, quite old age and still supported by their families, that because there is not an appropriate residential support, they remain within their own homes with cares, care packages under pressure. And actually what's happening is we don't know the scale of the problem. She describes them as being invisible, and therefore we don't know what the pressure at is on the on the carers and the community around about them. And that, is it the case that under the guise of a policy that we all support, we are missing a group of people who actually is, it shouldn't be. Well, we're not going to do what we did in the past, and therefore be a, we have a, 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 a policy approach which is failing. In fact, the, the, the petitioner talks about failing a group and the essential that we meet the real needs of this voiceless group and their families. I think that your offer to meet would be, I'm sure, would be welcomed. But I wonder if you would um, recognise that's what's at the heart of this petition, is that we're not identifying this particular group. Um, how, do we, how do we do that? And how do we then shape policy around their needs as well? So, um, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to you for... Um, for that question and for encompassing it in that way. Um, broadly speaking, I would agree. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we, I am very conscious that uh, we, we are working now to try and provide the right support in the right setting for a group of people who in the past would not be living as long as they now are. That is very welcome that they are. Uh, but that then does place uh, significant additional strain on their families. Uh, and I, I absolutely know uh, about the significant worry and concern that families have about wh what will happen uh, to uh, their son or daughter or whoever, uh, perhaps when they as parents are no longer here. Um, so I, I understand that. I, I wouldn't characterise it. I'm not really genuinely not trying to dance on the head of a pin here. I wouldn't characterise it as a policy failure, but I think what we have, what we are seeing is an inadequacy in the full extent of that policy and, and all of those that it should encompass. So I would want to stick with the core principles of the policy, but do more work now um, as the petitioner uh, argues for, and as, as you have uh, highlighted, to ensure that we really do know the numbers of people that we're talking about here. I do want to understand from the petitioner what they are, um, what they have in mind when they talk about residential care and how that might differ from what I have in mind when I talk about some of the good examples uh, that I touched on earlier. Um, this does feed into some of the uh, issues we touched on in the previous um, petition in terms of overall cost and charging and how some of that is managed and both Send Scotland and Enable have raised with me uh, their issues and their concerns about uh, high cost packages uh, not being uh, fully met um, we've given we are giving some consideration uh, and as a government as, into how we can assist in that way in order to ensure that local authorities um, uh, are to a degree uh, relieved of that additional uh, burden so that they can um, have less of a difficult choice in terms of some of their resourcing about, you know, do we fund a number of high cost packages and therefore not others or what might we do so there there are some there are some uh, complex areas to work through here but there are some clear basics that we can do more on a lot of which comes from dr mcdonald's report and some of it i have touched on so far
Thank you, Jackie Bill. I should probably declare an interest as the chair of the cross-party group on learning disability, and we very much welcomed um, Dr Macdonald's report, um, and I also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's, what I thought was a clear commitment to collecting data because, you know, we count what matters to us. Um, I have been working with a family, in fact, a number of families for more than three years now, and they are exactly as you described, those, those families where there are people with profound and complex learning disabilities, and their local authority is unable, not unwilling, but unable to deal with some of the large-scale packages that are very labour-intensive um, by local authority. So I was going to ask whether the Scottish Government would coordinate um, some of that effort across local authority boundaries to bring a lot of the people who are cared for away from whom actually cared for in institutions down in England and elsewhere, back to whom, but back to a collaborative approach that would provide some of this very small-scale, residential-supported, um, very labour-intensive accommodation much more locally. So, you know, given that you've partially answered that, based on your discussions with Enable and Senscot, I wonder whether you could unpack a bit more of that and when we would expect to see something because, as I say, I've had families waiting three, four years now. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely understand that, and I, I understand the, um, the, f the degree of frustration and the impatience to see the significant improvements that people want to see. Um, and I, as Ms Bailey and others will know, I'm a pretty impatient person myself. Um, now, we, we began... Uh, discussions uh, through COSLA in the summer around uh, uh, propositions about how we can look at the the high cost packages, um, which are high cost uh, over a number of years, uh, and how with local authorities and and in terms of overall funding approaches, uh, we can find a way through that. We haven't yet reached a conclusion. Um, we, we are doing some more thinking based on some of the responses they gave us, as are they. Uh, we're due to, to come back and continue those discussions. Uh, I wouldn't want to imply we've not had anything since the summer, but keep going to refine this through to see if we can find a way that we can afford uh, and is therefore sustainable, uh, but that meets those needs and also uh, meets those needs by providing the assistance that local authorities need, uh, and we will keep going in that direction. Uh, I'm quite keen that we reach, uh, and that that forms a significant strand in the reform of adult social care that I touched on earlier. I am really quite keen that we get uh, very close, if not actually, to a resolution on that element uh, in the summer, by the summer, uh, because it will need to then be something that I feed into uh, budget negotiations, of course, for uh, future years. Um, uh, so we're, we're working on that, and part of that then does uh, encompass our response to those elements of Dr McDonald's uh, recommendations about, uh, I can't recall her exact phrase, but I think it is inappropriate uh, out-of-area placements, I think is the phrase she uses. Um, and she has helpfully uh, produced some analysis of those out-of-area placements and what she means by that. And some of the out-of-area placements are out-of-area in Scotland, uh, as well as uh, south of the border. So uh, the work is underway to see what might we do here in a way that is financially sustainable, that works with our local authorities and our integration authorities in order to, to sh shift this along significantly. Thank you. Brian? <clears throat> Thank you, Kavina. Yeah, um, the petitioner uh, highlights highlights uh, the work that uh, groups like uh, Quarrier Scotland are, are doing in providing excellent care for those that have much less profound, uh, profoundly learning disabled and don't have the adequate medical support for the group uh, that we are currently discussing. Uh, and I wonder if the minister is aware that there is that gap between that kind of provision and the provision that will be required for those with much more substantial uh, requirements. So can you just... Sorry. The, um, as I said, the, the, the petitioner wanted to highlight the fact that there are, there are groups doing 
excellent work mm -hmm. in, the, in the community, such as Quarrier Scotland. Mm -hmm. But they are not working with the, with the groups yeah. that, that, that we are discussing today. And, mm -hmm. and just to recognise there is that gap between what they are providing and what the kind of provision that we are discussing today. Yes, I think that I think that's fair. I think there are other uh, stakeholder organisations, since Scotland has been mentioned, Enable, uh, who are um, uh, who have a, a significant understanding and degree of expertise in this area, and it is actually uh, they primarily, as well as others, who have raised with me the, the points that I was discussing a minute ago with uh, Ms Bailey uh, around the the extent and the complexity of the need and therefore what needs to be done to meet that need. So, th so there is um, uh, there is a uh, an under provision in uh, in practical terms for those with the most complex learning disabilities and needs. I wouldn't necessarily say that mean that is because there is a, a under understanding of what is needed. Uh, but it, is, it touches on what we're discussing uh, and what we therefore need to do uh, on the basis of that understanding to uh, improve how well we meet those needs. Uh, if I could very, very quick, uh, just, just an add, add end to that one, uh, Cabinet Secretary, we often hear uh, a lot of the, the issues lie around the transition from uh, children's services into adult services, and I wonder what consideration uh, you and the Scottish Government are giving in your deliberations in delivering this policy to that particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is a, um, a common uh, area of concern across a whole range of uh, levels of learning disability and needs and is one I'm very familiar with from the work that I did previously on the um, uh, disability delivery plan. Um, and so there are elements of the disability delivery plan that sits, sit with other portfolios that looks to address um, those uh, transition gaps in areas of education uh, and in other and employment and other areas of support. Um, similarly, at this more complex end, then I think uh, that needs to be part of the consideration that we give now to how we implement those recommendations and what more we need to do. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I really just wanted to um, highlight something the petitioner said in conclusion, because I think it's re reflected in, in the conversation about the danger of seeing this as a choice between what we do now and what we did in the 80s. And she says, many parents believe they can cope or are wrongly stigmatised for putting their children into what may be perceived as others as institutions. Um, that learning disability children can evolve greatly and their needs are different as they get older. Um, and she says uh, she believes that community care in itself is not the answer for this group. Scotland needs long-term residential care options for this vulnerable group and the Scottish Government should provide the funding in which to make this a reality and is suggesting that because we don't have this facility, there's an inadequate support, you know, a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the evening for people and therefore the burden on their families. Do you recognise that in pursuing the policy, which again, as uh, we all support, there is a danger of implying that those who believe there is still a need for residential care feel stigmatised in asking for that help for their young people? I, I recognise that that may well be the case, um, but I think I, I need to go back to my point that I, I, need to un, I need to understand better what the petitioner means when she talks about residential uh, and see uh, whether or not that is actually what we are trying to do with some of the examples that I highlighted earlier, or whether there is more that needs to be done as a consequence. That perhaps, in a parallel, perhaps with um, presumption in favour of inclusion in mainstream schooling, that we've ended up losing some of the specialist support that actually parents would say in presumption of mainstreaming doesn't mean that you shouldn't still have that very highly specialist provision for some. In fact, they shouldn't feel... Uh, that somehow they're, they're letting down their young person by asking for that support, that there may be a parallel here that we're closing down what people understand as the need for their own young person because of um, an adherence to a policy which somehow creates the impression that there, there should never be that kind of supported accommodation. Mm -hmm. so and that people, <clears throat> people are being left in the community with a bit of support from carers 
because of a very narrow interpretation of a policy, which I believe is, is actually, um, isn't narrow at all. It is, should be a wide spectrum of support. So I don't believe that everyone is being in this uh, group is being left in the community with an inadequate support. And I think some of the examples I've touched on and some of the other key stakeholder organisations would argue very strongly against uh, that um, a generalisation of that sort. I'm not suggesting you're making it convener, but I think for the record it's important to say that. What I do accept, though, is that there is uh, undoubtedly more that we need to do and we need to test out whether the policy, which I think we all broadly agree is the correct policy, has in either its, um, its sweep or in its implementation uh, unintentionally created a gap in provision and support that we now need to address. Okay, okay thank you. That's, that, that's very helpful. Can I thank you again for um, responding to our, our questions and I think particularly being so responsive to, to the issues around the petitioner herself has identified. I wonder if, um, I mean, that obviously is, is something that perhaps you know, we can ensure that the Cabinet Secretary has the information in terms of pursuing protocol of an invitation and so on. But in terms of our work, uh, the suggestions, what we should be doing with this. Rachel? Well, it's fascinating with the, the, the possible unintended consequences with this um, sort of lack of um, perhaps markers on the data set that may identify a, a hidden group of people with profound disabilities. And therefore, um, I think in my mind, until the Cabinet Secretaries met with the petitioner and understood the petitioner's um, absolute um, you know, aims within this petition and that those um, markers are created, I don't think that we can really formulate or take this as, as far forward as we'd want in the pace that we'd want. Well, I think, in my view, we've made more progress in the last hour than the petition has made in quite some time because there's been a conversation um, whether deliberately or otherwise, and I wouldn't say deliberately because that would be most unfair, but has simply missed the point, and that has been the, frust the frustration of the petitioner. I think we would want to hear from the petitioner um, the response to, to what's been heard, and of course other people with an interest in this area, whether it's the cross-party group or, or organisations that support individuals may have a view on what is, in some ways is about individual need, but it's also about the way in which policy is being implemented and how you ensure you've got the, the right information. So I, I would hope that we could also invite the petitioner to respond and would hope that others with an interest may want to respond too and that we can get a further update at a later stage in terms of how it's been progressed by the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government. Would that be acceptable? Agreed. Okay. Um, in that case, can I again thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for your attendance. I think that has been extremely productive and uh, is perhaps a, an interesting um, lesson about the benefits of actually direct conversations sometimes in correspondence, which can um, sometimes just feel like you know some of the, the, the substantial points have been missed. So thank you very much for your attendance today, and uh, thanks to everyone else, and I'll close the meeting.